We work on average with around 700 teachers each year. They're coming from all parts of Palestine. Some of them come from schools with smart boards, internet connectivity, really nice classroom setups. And others are coming from schools with no internet connection whatsoever, no heat or air conditioning, very overcrowded classrooms. I even visited a school that in a Bedouin camp, all kinds of schools, very different environments from teacher to teacher. And we're trying to take one training program and deliver it to all of them. Hey, welcome back to Adventures in Learning Design, a place to talk about how to design effective learning experiences. My name's Laurie Harrison. And my name is Laura Patsko, and we're from LearnJam, a purpose-driven learning agency and consultancy. In this episode, we're talking about the second dimension of inclusive learning design. And that dimension is the environment that includes things like the platform where learning is happening if it's an online course, the physical space or surroundings in which someone is studying, and the wider community or social context. And for this episode, we were joined by our guest, Rana Badwan. We recently worked with Rana on a project with the British Council called At Palestine, English for Digital Freelancers. And Rana has been working with the British Council for a number of years as a teacher, academic manager, project manager, focused on teaching English as a foreign language. And for the last three years, she's been designing and managing a training program for English teachers in Palestinian schools, where unsurprisingly, the environment for learning can be pretty challenging. So it was absolutely fascinating to hear Rana share her experiences. Okay, let's hand over to Rana. So one of the things that I have to really consider with um, any training that we do or any type of activity really that we do for teachers, anyone really, is the environment and how to make it as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. With virtual events, uh, we have to think a lot about whether or not that's going to help more people be included or whether it's going to end up excluding certain groups of people. That, that's a big part of what I do. Of course, there's also all of the, the boring stuff, sitting behind the computer, working on Excel, <laughs> writing up reports and things like that. But the fun part is, <laughs> um, is thinking about what teachers need and how to reach them. And mm. then the best part really is when I get to meet teachers and talk to them about mm -hmm. what's happening in their own classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what helps me the most and the other parts of my job. It gives me a lot of insight mm -hmm. into what's happening in different classrooms. Mm -hmm. Something that always comes up with everything we talk about, whether it's uh, strategies for teaching reading or um, 21st century skills, assessment for learning, whatever the topic is, teachers will always start to talk about their environment mm. and how some things will work for them mm -hmm. and then others won't because mm -hmm. their environment just doesn't allow for it. Right. So we have to really think about how we can um, take these kind of standard courses mm -hmm. and these standard teaching techniques that are meant for a global audience and how we can adapt them mm -hmm. and help teachers think creatively on how to apply them into mm -hmm. whatever their classroom environment is like. And that includes both the physical and potentially virtual environment? Yes. Are there any particular examples you can share anything from recent memory about those adaptations? Like, what is it that people do to make sure that the environment is inclusive? even if initially they feel like, oh, this won't work in my environment or in my classroom? I mean, one thing that always comes out, because we always promote a communicative way of teaching and encourage teachers to use um, things like pair work and group work and getting mm -hmm. students to work together on things. And something that always raises doubts in teachers' minds. And they always say, well, I can't do that because in my classroom, I've got 50 students, the tiny mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. desks are pushed together already from one wall to the next and there's no way to rearrange the classroom and so we get them to think well that's fine you don't have to make these nice little groups with 
um, you know, pushing four desks together and having a pretty group of four. You don't have to do it that way. Mm-hmm. You can just have students talk to the person next to them or get the people in front of them to turn their chairs around. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it, do things that way. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be exactly the way it was done in the video that you saw. Mm. Um, just think more creatively about mm. how you can work with what you've got in the classroom. Right, to achieve the same end. So <laughs> I guess it, I guess that's part of them understanding why that suggestion's being made in the first place. So if you're kind of all agreed on the principle, then how it looks in practice can be different in different environments uh, according to the constraints of your environment, I suppose. Getting them to realize that, okay, you don't have to use this uh, a certain website and display it on the smart board. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do it that way. You can just think creatively. What do you have? If you've mm-hmm. got a smartphone, can you just do it that way? Can you um, use a traditional projector, LCD projector or something? Mm-hmm. Can you, you know, find another way to mm-hmm. do it? So in that sense, I guess it's about teachers having access to resources and lesson plans and things you've created. Do the same sorts of issues come up with learners themselves? So things like, you know, what device do you have or what material do you have access to? I mean, where are some some exclusion risks and how do you get around them in terms of the environment? I think there are a lot, especially if you're thinking about um, students doing the same tasks, but from different environments, from different homes. Mm. Um, especially when if teachers are trying to do things that are, you know, a little bit more creative or asking students to do project work from home because they have access to different materials. Um, somebody might have, uh, you know, a, an art kit that has a hundred different pieces with um, crayons, colored pencils, paint, and mm. different colored paper, and mm-hmm. you know, a whole mm. supply of of art. Um, of things that they can use and then someone else might just have a spiral um, notebook Mm -hmm. and a pencil Mm -hmm. and that's what they've got often the resources that are given to teachers to put into practice are they don't seem ambitious to the person writing them they just seem kind of fun and creative and yay let's you know color this in blue and you know use a bigger piece of paper and for the student who doesn't have that it's, it's too easy to fall down at the first hurdle and say, well, I don't have those resources. Whereas if they know why you're suggesting that, then maybe they can use whatever they have. Like you say, like yeah, if it's a spiral bound mm-hmm. notebook and a pen, that might be enough. Um, Even for teachers, I mean, I, I struggled with this and I worked at a nice private language school. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was teaching with the British Council and um, I mean, we had way more resources than the mm-hmm. average teacher and I mm-hmm. still struggled with it with mm-hmm. the course books. And, you know, they would want something as simple as, um, you know, the little, the little pinwheel things to make like a clock, for example. Oh, those things. Yeah, those little split pins, you know, you put in the paper yeah. and make a, yeah, I remember activities like that yeah. as well when I was teaching and thinking, where am I and supposed I to find could, this? I could never find them anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, forget needing like somebody having it purchased by um the school i i would have been willing to go get them but i couldn't figure out where to find them anywhere. yeah, but yeah. there would be a lot of things like that where we would just have to you know think creatively and mm-hmm. um sometimes you would have to go and i would go and buy things myself um for the sake of, of simplicity or mm-hmm. sometimes you just couldn't find them it wasn't an issue of of money mm-hmm. it was just a and that's not available. Yeah um, or the time it takes to find them is insane and not it doesn't yeah. feel like it. Um, brown paper bags to make like little puppets. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, brown uh, paper bags. Wow, yeah, that takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I almost bought or had my, actually I almost had my mother buy a pack and bring it with her from America to Palestine to use them <laughs> to, to make, make puppets. puppets. Wow. <laughs> and then oh I was my like, goodness. you know what? We can just yeah. make puppets on sticks. Let's just right. get some little popsicle sticks or something and oh, let's just make a different kind of puppet or get yeah. some socks or something. Mm, so yeah. I think, you know, you have to have that kind of mindset. You have to improvise. You're not yeah. trying. Yeah. 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 You're not trying to do the exact same activity the exact same way. You right. have to be a little creative.
I wonder if, um, have you found in your experience of this past year or two with a lot of education moving online or trying to move online because of the lockdown restrictions in various places or, or even before lockdown, you know, travel, distances of travel to school being impractical. Have you found that even experienced teachers are struggling to make the most of the virtual environment in the same way that when we began teaching in a physical environment, we had these kinds of, uh, you know, even with a well-resourced staff room, we might not be able to find the resources we want. I wonder if that's, if that's been part of your past year's experience, is that feeling of being a beginner again, because the environment's changed. Oh, definitely. I think so. Um, and one thing has been with different um, ministries of education and different schools, you know, putting out a standard of we must use X platform. Mm-hmm. for teaching um, as a, for example, the Minister of Education in Palestine decided to use Teams mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with Teams. I love it. We use it as well, but they weren't aware. They didn't think about the fact that most teachers who had experience doing things online, whether through like um, other organizations and just in their own time, mm-hmm. were used to using Zoom. Right. Uh-huh. So there was this big thing at the beginning of last school year with teachers, um, you know, not wanting to use Teams or wanting to use Zoom just mm. because of its familiarity. Mm. And there had to be a whole, a whole lot of training uh-huh. on how to use it. Uh-huh. Um, basic things about just how to um, get started on it. And then once they were used to just, using it as a basic tool then there was of course training on okay well how do you actually deliver a lesson yeah. mm. like how do you use tool? it as a pedagogical tool you're right yeah. exactly because yeah. logging in and listening in on a webinar is mm-hmm. very different of course to teaching mm-hmm. a lesson that's a good point though isn't it because there's often an assumption that just basic use of common tools is is a given so you know mm-hmm. let's assume that everyone is fine with that and then mm. build from there. But if mm-hmm. that basic building block isn't in place, then, then nothing else is going to work. I mean, mm. I remember in March 2020 when I, I did my first kind of online training sessions through Zoom. And it, it kind of seemed almost unimaginable now, but I had to spend like 10 minutes at the start of the first class with the group walking them through how to use Zoom, you know, mm-hmm. how to raise your hand, how to mute yourself, how mm-hmm. breakout rooms work. Actually, probably not even breakout rooms. That was probably a bit more advanced. That came later. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people were just stumped by the, the tool because they just weren't familiar with yeah. it. Even if you're familiar with a different tool that does the same job under the pressure of teaching a class, that extra sort of cognitive load of just dealing with an unfamiliar tool, even if you conceptually, you know what it does, that's a whole load of extra pressure and it just makes it harder to, to focus on the, you know, making a good lesson because you're just trying to yeah. deal with the basics. Yeah. Aren't you? We still with every kind of virtual meeting or, or training, mm-hmm. anything virtual that we do, we still attach uh, a document that kind of mm-hmm. lays out um, some basic guidance about how to download an app if you need to download an app with screenshots kind of showing that um, basics around how to mute yourself mm-hmm. um, why you should mute yourself yeah if you're yeah. not speaking you know it's not to be rude we do want to hear from you but background <laughs> noise echo yeah. yeah things like that and um, selling out as much as we can because you don't know what each person is coming there with yeah um and this actually, this issue of people not knowing those basic things, um, it sparked one, one teacher that we worked with to create a whole series of YouTube videos um, mm-hmm. in Arabic for wow. other teachers on how to use some of these tools. Oh, wow. Because a lot of people were coming to her and mm-hmm. asking her questions because there wasn't much support available in Arabic for those tools. So. Right. I think that's another issue with a lot of them mm. is that the, yeah, yeah. the support is only available in certain languages. Yeah. That's a very good point, isn't it? That must be quite a common barrier to accessing not just the lesson content, but the tool in the first place. You know, if you can't yeah. log in, exactly. can't figure it out because it's not in a language that you're fluent in. Um, that is a really interesting point, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, English as the language of the internet 
And it's a kind of, mm. as an English speaker, it's a kind of an invisible barrier, I think, in a lot of cases. It wouldn't mm. even occur to you that actually, you know, I take it for granted, how to information or guides on how to do stuff is all in English. And even when it's a guide, depending on how it's provided, I mean, I get around mm. this sometimes if I'm trying to learn to do something or if I need to do something and there's a website in Greek, which I'm still learning mm. and I'm sort of basically literate, but I don't know all the vocabulary. But some browsers like Google Chrome, you could just click a translate button and yes. sort of figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I get immediately stuck when it says, click here to read the PDF because you can't do that. <laughs> it can't translate yeah. that. So, yeah. you know, for learners who are navigating this whole virtual world and teachers, of course, even mm -hmm. when they find these kind of hacks to get over those initial barriers, it's not long before you can meet another one. And if you have enough, yeah it can be very demotivating to have multiple barriers in your way before you're even into the lesson itself. And so and I like that phrase you used, like sort of invisible barriers, because it's like anything, you know, once you're sort of in the club, you know, once you've got mm. access to something, it's easy to forget how it felt not to have yeah. that access and how frustrating it could be not to have that access. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, yeah, if you've just never experienced not having that access. Yeah. That, that, that's the it ultimate. It just doesn't cross your mind. It's yeah, like, it just doesn't. Never even occur to you. That's the definition yeah. of privilege, isn't it? So we need to be careful not to assume that teachers automatically know how to use particular pieces of software or tools. But moving on, Rana then talked about how we also often make assumptions about learners, particularly young learners and the assumption that they are automatically incredibly adept with all kinds of technology. And is this the say, I mean, we've talked a bit about um, teachers and using say Teams or Zoom and so on, but the learners themselves, I suppose, depending on their age, depending on their background, their education, their experience of the world of, of professional life or whatever, they might not know Teams or Zoom. Um, they might be using something like WhatsApp or Facebook on their phone, but not for learning historically. Is that something else that you'd encountered? Well, ever, I was gonna say recently in the recent year, but maybe even before COVID. Oh, absolutely. Um, something that is always coming up is whether or not we can really describe um, young people as being digitally literate. Mm. Yes. Most of them have smartphones. Mm -hmm. Yes, they know how to use tools. Uh, you know, they, they all use social media on their smartphones. But do they know how to send an email? Mm. How many young people have, have, you know, like proper email accounts that they know how to send emails from and, and do that regularly and, and understand, you know, the way email communication works, for example. Mm -hmm. that, that's not something many people do very much anymore, actually. Mm. Um, even for school, a lot of it is through, you know, certain LMS platforms where they might send a message mm. to a teacher. Like just short messages. An assignment through that. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do they have how to, how do it attach a document to things? Mm. Um, so I, we, we struggle with this a lot because they only know how to use technology for certain things. Yeah. It's not, it's not learning in mm -hmm. general, um, especially not in, in Palestine, um, not before the pandemic, at least. Mm -hmm. um, my own kids, they really struggled at the beginning. And thankfully, I was, I was really used to using these different tools. I'd been using them for, for years. Mm -hmm. So it, I was able to show them and sit with them and, you know, walk them through it. And I would just be in, in the next room while if they needed help, while they were supposed to be in class or something. But that wasn't the case for a lot of, a lot of learners. Mm. And they didn't have somebody in the household who had used the tools before mm -hmm. and who could, who could show them how to do it. They had to figure it out on mm. their own or they just would give up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the, the myth of the digital native, isn't mm -hmm. it? That, you know, if, <laughs> yeah, any young person or kid, you just throw any piece of tech at them and they'll just instantly yeah. get it and be able to do anything with it. And like you said, there are, there are very specific things that they're really good at using technology for, mm -hmm. things that they're interested in, you know, things related to socializing or games and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But like you said, very specific skills that, that you need in a learning context, an online learning context. Mm -hmm. you know, which might be specific to the platform that's being used, for example, mm -hmm. that you know, why would they ever have used 
teams before, you know. <laughs> it's pretty unlikely, you know, you're not going to use that for, for leisure as a teenager. Are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because I think what you've just touched on or illustrated there is the the huge range of ways in which a learner's environment can affect their access to a learning experience. So from the sort of really micro level of the platform they're using or the mobile device they're using, right up to the really meta stuff that doesn't even seem to be about learning. Like you would never ask an incoming student who's say 15, gonna take an English course, does your mum know how to use Zoom? <laughs> mm. However, that aspect of their family environment actually does have an effect on their learning experience because as you said your kids were able to tap into your knowledge of something to help them with their learning experience so it it's one of those things that completely transcends so many spheres of their life it doesn't even seem like it would affect inclusivity of a learning experience but in a way it does because other kids maybe their mom doesn't know zoom or teams and couldn't help them and they might need to find access in a different way so that's actually a really nice illustration of this whole, you know, principle of the complexity of inclusivity and, and how barriers can arise and be removed. And then there's the kind of in between, I suppose, the, the what we've sometimes called the like the macro level, like so the bigger picture things that affect inclusivity. And are more obviously related to the learning environment. So things like um, digital access or connectivity. Okay, let's talk connectivity and access then. That's something we haven't actually said a lot about yet. Um, and I wonder mm. what you mentioned visiting a lot, a lot of schools in different contexts, some very resourced, um, some, I think you mentioned a Bedouin camp. Uh, so very diverse range of environments. Mm -hmm. How have you found connectivity in different learners' environments and experiences? Has that been an issue at all in the, in the virtual learning sense? Absolutely. I think it has in some ways limited the use of synchronous learning, mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, the use of video, right. things like that, because internet connection in Palestine is generally very weak. Mm -hmm. And just recently they announced that 4G would be coming to Palestine right. because mm -hmm. um, 3G was, mm -hmm. has been the fastest that we've yeah. had. Mm -hmm. In right. Gaza, they don't even have 3G. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. still on 2G. So oh, yeah. um, internet connectivity and speed is definitely an issue. Yeah. Um, another thing we know is that for a lot of learners, um, a lot of homes in general, they don't have you know a, a Wi-Fi connection. They're just accessing their internet through a, a, their data package on their phones. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and there's got to be a cost factor there. So, mm. so yeah, you're not going to be wanting to download tons of video even if you could. Just because exactly. it's going to burn through your allowance of data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it, that also puts extra pressure on selecting what video, you know, you can't just go, oh, let's look at this one and see if it's any good. Oh, let's look at this one and see, mm -hmm. you know, spend an hour watching 20 videos because you have, that might, like you say, just burn through all your data. So the planning element also increases yeah. then <laughs> because you have to think, well, if they're going to use data to access this, it better really be worth it. Um, better be exactly what they need and no more and no less, you know. Teachers have had to be creative in how they use mm. asynchronous tools instead and still try to make it feel like, you know, the students are interacting with each other and that the teacher is interacting with them as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them have resorted to things like Facebook and WhatsApp. Mm. Um, one, because they're familiar, but also because it, it just makes it easier for the learners mm -hmm. you know, to share something on there and then people to to have a look when it, it, if for example later on they're able to have wi-fi access mm -hmm. from a public space or, or something like that let's move on from the virtual environment the online environment to the physical so the location or the space where people are trying to study and what about their physical surroundings so again the there's i think quite a lot of diversity in the your students learning environments so it could be that some students have wi-fi and some don't even have 3g and then in terms in physical space i mean does everyone have a quiet space to study i guess probably not or you know are they sharing devices or what's been your experience there um i 
don't think that there's any family who has a quiet space for each child to work in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least, at least there would be very, very few. Yeah. Um, if there is one kind of designated space in the home for work slash study, then that's a very fortunate family mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. Um, for most people, it has been the you know uh, just kitchen table or um, you know sitting on each kid sitting on their bed trying mm-hmm. to to connect or do their work. Um, the quiet space is very rare, mm-hmm. I would say, yeah. mm-hmm. um, very limited. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's definitely. Uh, an issue and then the general home environment isn't always the um the most comfortable learning environment i would say for some people Hmm. um especially when there's extreme weather and you might not have um, heat or air conditioning at home Mm -hmm. um and that can make it difficult to focus Mm -hmm. um if you've got construction happening right next to you and there's a lot of noise and yeah. you just can't focus um, you can't hear if you're trying to listen to something mm-hmm. um, if you've got four or five other siblings running around some who are too young for school and are just you know, running around playing or mm-hmm. each person is trying to do their own work or um, so the potential for distraction is very high then absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. Families are generally big, lots of mm. kids, yeah. um, possibly multiple generations living together. Mm-hmm. A lot of distractions. So, it's, yeah, challenges piled up on top of other challenges, isn't it? Really, you, know, you think about yeah, connectivity, access to devices, an environment where you can actually focus. And you said that teachers have to get creative about how they respond to this and how they can actually provide a, a meaningful learning experience for the students with some of the strategies or techniques or approaches that are actually effective given those multi-layered challenges that learners are having to deal with? I think the, the most important thing is to be flexible and just um, understanding of the learner's environment and you know rather than have one set way that you expect all students mm. to do something whether it's joining a virtual lesson, um, submitting an assignment, practicing, whatever it is that you're asking mm. them to do. Yeah. Be flexible, have multiple ways that they can mm. still engage. Yeah. Depending on what what's the, the resources available to them, the environment they're they're in. So I suppose that might be yeah. something like if they had to submit written work, you could give them the option of writing it by hand and submitting it, typing it and printing it sending it as a electronic text via WhatsApp or Facebook or email, but having that range of ways so that the teacher still gets evidence of their written work, mm-hmm. but it can come in different forms depending on what the student can provide. Is that the sort of thing you, you've you uh, seen people sort of experimenting with in, in terms of flexibility? Yes, exactly. Those kinds of things. Maybe somebody will have you know, as we said before, just a, a spiral brown notebook and mm-hmm. a pencil so they can, and okay, there might be a worksheet that's been sent electronically, but they mm-hmm. don't have access to a printer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they can fill it out or write their answers down on a piece of notebook paper. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have a scanner, so they use a phone, they take a picture of it, mm-hmm. and they send that through mm-hmm. WhatsApp mm-hmm. Yeah. to their teacher. Mm-hmm or they upload, they send it to their teacher via their parents' Facebook or, or something like that. The possibilities are endless, but it does take time and energy to think flexibly, doesn't it? And I suppose that's what, I mean, teaching is inherently of a creative skill, I think, um, and very tiring. <laughs> I remember yeah. spending hours trying to think of creative ways of doing stuff, um, not necessarily because th- there was an obvious challenge, but just because it seemed like it would be more fun if I got a bit creative. But it. it it's hard. It's hard to be so flexible. Um, yeah. To make sure that you're sort of providing a learning environment that everybody can get the most from. And presumably, as a teacher, when you are also facing your own challenges and working in a very difficult environment mm. in, in a similar way. On top of that, the parents have to be almost as creative and as mm. flexible as the teachers. 
Right. Yeah. Because in some cases, the teacher won't give them all these different options or ideas. They have to come up with mm-hmm. their own mm-hmm. for how they can help the learner. If the learner's young, if, if you know, if they're a little bit older, they might be able to do some of that mm-hmm. creative thinking and adapting on their own. There are a lot of other people involved, not just the teacher. That's a really good point. There's a lot of different people involved and also within one person, I suppose there's a lot of different aspects. You know, if we're thinking about learners in a holistic way, they're not just learners. Mm. They're also brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. And, you know, they've got all the other things happening at home that we've described, you know, like sharing rooms with people, having distractions. Um, And I suppose that can spill over into anything else that's not related to learning, like being hungry or being tired or being too hot or, you know, so there's so many um, like overlapping (laughs) influences on that, on that learning environment. You know, we call it the environment, but it's made up of so many things. We moved on to talk about the enormous variation between different countries and the level of support that schools, teachers and students get depending on where they are in the world. I think one thing that that has been interesting over the last year is to compare what different parts of the world, how they're reacting and responding to that. How are they trying to mitigate that? What are they doing to equal, equalize the the learning environment Hmm. to make it more fair to, to different students? And it depends a lot on, I think, the country and even the part of the country what's possible because mm-hmm. it all comes down to resources doesn't mm. it but um i know my sister's kids this was not in palestine this was in america but each student's family was um given a time to come into the school and kind of pick up uh, a set of supplies mm-hmm. and that not only included um a, a laptop but it also included headphones Mm -hmm. Um, It included puzzles Mm -hmm. and storybooks. Wow. Um, I think even little math counters. Mm -hmm. So a a whole range of of supplies that you'd find in, um, uh, that you might find in a classroom that they could use at home. Wow. Things that went beyond just like the course books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was so impressed by that. It's like a tiny little classroom in a box, isn't it? Just send each student home with their own little classroom in a box. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were really lucky. And you just think, you know, if if everyone had some version of that, mm-hmm. it would have made such a big difference. That's a really interesting example. I hadn't realized, I suppose now you mention it, I guess some schools must have the resources to do that. But yeah, it, it illustrates the gap between what some students have access to and others um, don't. Next, we talked about the kinds of support that's available to learners, whether from family, friends, the community. We also touched on attitudes to online learning. Have you noticed any differences before and after, or I suppose it's not over yet. I was gonna say before and after COVID, but COVID continues. (laughs) No after. (laughs) There's no after, no, no. But yeah, in terms of sort of family support and attitudes towards learning and so on, have you noticed anything changing or developing in the past year or two? I think I'm, I'm still waiting for, for a change in attitude. Um, mm. I think I might be starting to see one, right? Uh, I don't know. We're, we will see. <laughs> um, there's the attitude towards online learning, I think. I mean, it went from, no, it's impossible, to, mm-hmm. okay, it works, but it's not as good. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping it will reach a point where people see that okay not only is it possible that it can work and it can work really well Mm -hmm. but i I don't think we're quite there yet and i think what has yeah Yeah. (laughs) you've had um you know university students and their parents uh demanding refunds or reimbursements for tuition because they feel that you know online education isn't the same isn't mm-hmm. of the same value and mm-hmm. they shouldn't have to pay as much and mm-hmm. um, the same for schools with um private schools for example some actually did give a discount mm-hmm. for and reimburse part of their tuition because of that attitude of well this isn't of the same quality this isn't yeah. the quality that we're paying for mm-hmm. 
In terms of support, teachers themselves do a lot more than what they do in the classroom. And with mm-hmm. COVID, they're, they're being asked by people in their community, their neighbours, um, family members, uh, close friends to provide um, extra support for them. Mm-hmm. So if, if you don't know how to use one of these uh, tools that we've talked about, mm-hmm. uh, you think about the teachers in your community. Mm. who maybe do mm-hmm. and you'll call on them to come over mm-hmm. and help you out with them mm-hmm. yeah um if your child is really struggling with um english then you'll think about the local village english teacher mm-hmm. and ask them for mm-hmm. for extra help and support mm-hmm. you'll think about okay who's a teacher in my family that i can call on right. to mm-hmm. help with this mm-hmm. so teachers i think are, are actually being asked to do a lot more in terms of support the other side is is learners are missing a lot of the support mm. that they would get from going to school. Mm-hmm. Um, social support, um, mm-hmm. if they don't have friends that live around them, yeah. um, that social environment for some is just is gone. Yeah. Um, maybe they're they're not playing with friends, even if they have friends around them, mm-hmm. uh, because of you know concerns about. Um, getting sick and things uh-huh. like that, uh-huh. or government regulations against gathering. Uh-huh. So that I think has had a big effect on people as well, uh-huh. um, especially on, on learners. Yeah, just those things that become part of your whole experience of school by yeah. virtue of being physically there mm-hmm. have been missing, and then that yeah. that I suppose then also trickles down, doesn't it, to people's attitudes towards learning in general and the you know what's the point of doing xyz like they want to feel like every minute has some explicit value and that's not always easy to demonstrate when everyone involved is learning uh you know yeah. sort of figuring it out as they go mm-hmm. because they haven't had time to be trained or you know haven't got the resources things that we mentioned earlier so yeah those incidental aspects that keep you going that aren't there it's been a challenge this year hasn't it yeah do you think the the fact that it's difficult or impossible to to use synchronous video based classes as the core do you think that kind of mm. exacerbates that problem that sort of sense of isolation or exclusion that learners might feel sort of cut off if they're not actually interacting live with the teacher through video does that kind of add to that definitely it like it would. Um, yeah i mean just think when whenever you've been in a, a learning environment and you're given a task when you don't quite understand what's yeah. the first thing you do, it's not to ask your teacher or ask your <laughs> to turn to the person sitting next to you. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. that's what students do. They immediately put their heads together and start talking yep. about it. Mm. So when you can't do that, mm. what do you do? Um, and if you don't have, you know, if you don't have your own phone to just quickly message your friend and ask mm-hmm. them yeah. um, or do a, a little FaceTime call or something, yeah. to work on it together yeah. um, or you know your your older brother or sister is busy doing their own work and your parents are at work you, you don't have anyone to help you yeah so then you just get frustrated and give up i guess mm-hmm. i suppose the opportunities for want of a better word for that to happen have increased dramatically since everybody's been in this new unfamiliar environment. So the likelihood mm. of you thinking, hang on, wait, what do I have to do? Or how do I do that? Yeah. Has gone yeah. up to, you might have thought yeah. it twice during a, a face-to-face lesson. Now you're thinking it 20 times during an <laughs> online mm. lesson. And, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And I mean, think, you know, as a, as a teacher, I would just looking at students' faces, mm-hmm. you, you know if they're getting it or not. Yeah. Mm, you, yeah. You're giving instructions for an activity. And you're look, you're watching their faces, and you can see. Okay, wait, let me go over that again. You don't have to ask them; you can just see it. You can sense it um, online. online. <laughs> yeah, it's harder. Yeah. yeah, it is harder online. I find this really interesting because I think the the examples that you give are these really beautiful little vignettes of what it classroom practice really looks like. Like, if you pick up a a methodology book on teaching, it won't. I don't think I've ever seen one that has a chapter on how to get an instinctive sense from your students' faces that they're (laughs) following. You know, whereas this is what teachers feel with experience. What they will have is pages and pages of, you know, how to give clear instructions, how to check your instructions and so on. But actually, a lot of the kind of inclusive moments or risks of 
being excluded are in these little nuanced behaviors, like just mm. reading your students' faces. And yeah. I, I find that, yeah, that's a really nice example of the kind of just seeing whether they're getting it, <laughs> like you say. Mm. Um, that's, that, that's quite challenging, I suppose, in the online environment. Not impossible, but you have to, like, it's like you keep saying, Rena, like you have to be creative to think of different ways of achieving this understanding and so on. But it makes us all beginners again, <laughs> going back yes. and learning, wait a minute, how do I check that they got it? So lots of difficulties connected with the move to online, but it can't all be bad news, right? Rena, we talked a lot about the, the challenges of having to of learning, having to move online. Have there been any any benefits or positives that have come out of it in the in the context in which you work? I think so. I mean, one thing that we noticed with um, our teacher training program is that more teachers, some teachers were able to participate and engage more than they'd been mm -hmm. able to do so in the past mm -hmm. because it was it was it was all virtual. Yeah. Right. And um, they were able to engage um, easily while doing the their other other things at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have to worry about getting to a training venue mm, um, and yeah. taking that time out of their out of their day or out of their weekend leaving home to to get to the place or paying for transportation mm. those kinds of things they were just yeah. able to do it um from home uh while being around their family mm -hmm. maybe even doing some multitasking cooking dinner while watching a webinar right that yeah. kind of thing yeah um yeah. So it, it, in a sense, it made it, it, more teachers were able to be included in a lot of our work. Mm. Another thing that I've, I've noticed and that I found really interesting is how much more easily students are able to participate and stay caught up on their schoolwork mm. if they're not able to go to school. And what I mean here is with COVID, a lot of classrooms, and this just depends on the school, if when they were doing face-to-face -face at certain points, you know, there would be a period where we'd be doing face-to-face -face again, and then we'd have to go back online, mm -hmm. things like that. But what, even when they would be doing face-to-face, -face, if somebody got sick and couldn't come into school, a lot of times they had a camera set up in the classroom mm -hmm. or, yeah. or something set up that yeah. students could join from home. Mm -hmm. um, and teachers were a lot better about sending materials uh, to students, uh -huh. you know, day by day, so that they could still participate, stay caught up. That's something I think that wasn't mm. we weren't as good about before. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody, you know, got sick and they had to stay out of school for a week or two, mm -hmm. they wouldn't really get much. They just have to wait till they got back and try yeah. and play catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if that'll continue. Hmm. Yeah, I think it will. I think that applies to learning and also to work. Actually, in a way, it's like the. Mm -hmm. The toothpaste is out of the tube on that, so it's kind of hard to go back. <laughs> um, Hopefully. Yeah. So I think some companies are, yeah. are trying to, to get it yeah, back Yeah, they, they, they yeah, yeah. They yeah. push the toothpaste back. But, uh, <laughs> but what has been proven is that despite a lot of challenges and flaws, that it is possible to learn remotely. It is possible to work remotely in a way that I think a lot of people assumed that it just wasn't possible at all mm -hmm. Yeah, pre-pandemic. So someone has to be out of school for a couple of weeks, they can still do some meaningful learning mm -hmm. rather than the previous assumption would be, like you said, well, they just won't do anything. Well, they might do a tiny bit of reading or something, but mm -hmm. that's, they can't really do anything because they're not in school. Yeah. And now we know that if you're not in school, you can still learn. And if you're not at the office, you can still work. Yeah. And everyone knows that now. Yeah. You know, e yeah. even if you don't believe that you can learn as effectively or work as effectively, everyone believes that you can learn mm -hmm. and you can work mm -hmm. to some degree. So I think mm -hmm. that will be a kind of lasting legacy, I guess. I hope uh, so. Hopefully a positive, yeah. Even my father-in-law is now a believer when it comes to online learning. And right. he's a very yeah. traditional old school Mm -hmm. um, Arabic professor at a university mm -hmm. in, in Palestine. And I, he had never really touched technology before. He just got a smartphone recently. He's not, right. he's not very, very yeah. into it or on top of it. But um, he has fallen in love with online learning because he's like, I don't even have to get in the car, drive anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. can just 
And if students aren't there, it's recorded. They mm-hmm. don't have to ask me anything. Mm-hmm. It's all right there. He's like, I have my little, he has a little whiteboard that he sets up even. Oh, and, nice. You know, like, yeah. I mean, so he's yeah, combining he's, the, he's, the traditional methods yeah. he prefers <laughs> with the new environment that he has to work in. And it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just gotten really used to it. And he's like, I, I never want to go back to the office again or to a lecture hall. This works yep. just fine. Wow. Um, mm, yeah, that's great. I think it's a nice example as well of the fact that this is not an either or situation. I mean, we can all borrow the best bits of different environments to make a, a kind of blended or mixed or complex or whatever you want to call it environment that can include more people because it speaks to them in ways that they need. So for some people, they'll be like, actually, this digital environment works better for me than the physical one did uh, or vice versa or parts of it yeah. do. That's a definite positive. Laurie, your question, I think, yeah. was, you know, what are the, some of the benefits? I think that's a, that's a clear benefit is we can learn from all of this what yeah. works well. Yeah, and I think teachers have also seen, they're also starting to think because of the back and forth between face-to-face and online, they've started to see how some tools that they were using for online teaching can actually be used in the classroom. Mm, any examples of that? Um, sure. I mean, some of the the tools that they've used to make lessons interactive, um, mm. different online learning games, now they're saying, oh, well, actually, you know, this is a fun homework activity for students right. yep. rather than giving them a, a worksheet or a page in their workbook to do. Yeah. I can just have them practice on, on this website or something mm. like that. Or using different, um, they've, they've learned about new websites for audio for practicing listening mm-hmm. um, mm. lots of, of things like that i think um i had to do collaborative writing through google docs for mm-hmm. example yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. you know even if you're you're doing online face-to-face lessons you can still use that to get students to engage with each other at home for homework or take some of those tools and, and mm-hmm. try and find ways to use them in class if you've got access some of the same technology Uh right let's move on when you're working in a context where conflict and violence is an ever-present part of life then trauma is something that you have to be able to deal with as a teacher so runa told us a bit more about that and what that means in her context we we used to face um this this, um, I guess, challenge as teachers during our summer schools, Mm -hmm. Um, particularly with um, students in Jerusalem, um, children who just had had faced a lot of difficult situations and um, were really traumatized Mm -hmm. by some of the things that had happened to them or in front of them. Mm -hmm. And they really struggled um, I'll never forget, I wasn't there for it, but there was um, one student who just got underneath a table in the classroom and would not stop screaming. And she would not come out from underneath the table. Mm. And as a teacher, h- how do you deal with that? It, that's not something you're trained to deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not something you're, you're taught in university or in SALTA, mm-hmm. um, how, to, how to deal with a traumatized student. And if it's not something you should have to deal with in a sense. Um, It's not your job, but your job is to figure out how to to manage that learning environment Mm. and help that learner and the rest of the learners um, to the best of your ability Mm -hmm. as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's really difficult for teachers to kind of to separate that those roles and come to grips with what is within their um, role as a teacher and, and what yeah. isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually that's, it just goes to show how it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an artificial division to say, you know, just teach your subject because yeah. as much as we can say, you know, like, like you're saying, it's really difficult for teachers to separate those roles. It's clearly just as difficult for some students to separate their mm-hmm the parts of their mind and body and soul that are dealing with the subject matter and the parts that are dealing with life. So we don't, exactly. a- we don't ask them to separate those roles. You know, we can't expect teachers to mm. make a nice clean cut division either. It's, it is a challenge. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I I know when when there would be um, event when something would happen in the in the country and it would be all over the news and I I would know that it would be on students' minds. Mm -hmm. um, even though they're adults, they with adults they still they all still struggle. We yeah. as teachers would be struggling and they as students would be struggling. Mm -hmm. And that would be when the lesson plan would just have to go out the window and mm -hmm. um, you would have to make sure you gave time to what was on students' minds. Mm -hmm. Now we would always try to make sure that we still benefited in terms of English mm -hmm. uh, language and you know have discussions in English or debates in English or mm -hmm. um, find some useful language to talk about it. But I make sure that they have that space mm -hmm. to to you know get what was on their mind or on their chest mm -hmm. to just get it out really yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um like because otherwise it, nothing you do is gonna is gonna be effective their their, their mind's just not yeah. on learning mm -hmm. present perfect mm -hmm. you know <laughs> you're not gonna get them <laughs> right time. right yeah <laughs> so let's now let's look at this verb <laughs> and they're yeah. you know really not ready for that yeah, yeah. yeah. or let's do this role play pretend you're shopping in a market right now yeah yeah, yeah. that's not what they want to do no. at that mm -hmm. moment um and this is this has come up recently um with uh, a group of teachers um in gaza actually they are trying to set up a program or a training program that's focusing on um, psychosocial support mm -hmm. and what teachers, what they can do as teachers with their students. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, their ideas is to focus on how they can use drama, mm -hmm. and drama to help students with their trauma, basically. Mm -hmm. right. I'm just thinking of small uh, drama activities mm. that, that can help. Um, and a lot of them, some of them have seen a lot of success with that through, oh. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but through the Hands Up Project. The Hands Up Project was founded by Nick Bilbro and they, he connects um, different volunteers from around the world with uh, students in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And initially it was just a lot of um, storytelling. So the volunteer using storytelling as a way to, to help learners develop their English and get them speaking a little bit of English, mm. things like that. And um, over the last two or three years, um, he's been running remote uh, theater competitions right. where groups of learners will um, write a play together and yeah. then perform it. Uh, they submit it and it, it's this big competition mm. and they, they put together little um, books with some of the plays uh -huh. and he's also done a lot of teacher training um around using drama i know i attended one of his trainings like two years ago on using drama and it was amazing to see how teachers engaged with it and the idea was for them to then of course take it back to their schools and set up little drama clubs right. yeah for for palestinian students that ability to connect with somebody outside of the country yeah um, it's just it's such a good opportunity for them and something they really relish because it, for many of them, if it wasn't through that, they wouldn't have that opportunity. Yeah. And it, it builds their confidence, their motivation to learn English. Mm. And it, it helps them deal with that trauma, really. Exactly, exactly. I think it's a really nice example of how something that on the surface is a sort of practice your English activity actually speaks to so many aspects of their lived experience. Yeah, we were sort of touching on this artificial barrier between or the sort of role, you know, I'm in the role of learner, I'm in the role of student and that, how that's kind of separated from the rest of your life. And this feels like a, a way to kind of break down that barrier, bridge your learner role with what's going on in your life more generally uh, in a really positive way. And like you said, to make connections and engage and meet people outside of Gaza, for example, you know, which mm. I always imagine must be incredibly challenging. So it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a, a stage in your classroom or, or a, mm. you know, you, you don't have to have much, you don't have to have costumes for them to dress up with or, or anything. You can find something really mm. simple. You could play an audio file from your phone for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it can get students thinking outside of what's going on around around them. It can help them just take on this role and mm. you know forget things for a little bit, a little while, or imagine they're somewhere yeah. else. Rana, I mean, off the back of that whole conversation, have you got any final thoughts or or anything else that's on your mind that you'd like to share? Uh, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about how the learning environment can present challenges. But I think we just have to keep in mind that every environment can be a learning environment. Mm. It it doesn't have to be um, a classroom with reading nooks and um, craft tables. And then it, it doesn't have to be something like that. It doesn't have to be have smart boards. It doesn't have to be even a a home office with the, that's a quiet space, a private space. It doesn't have to have the latest technology. If you've got an open mind and you've mm. got the desire to learn, you're going to learn. And for teachers, for learners, for their parents, you have to keep that in mind. Um, learning can happen anywhere. If you want it to happen, it's going to happen. So no such thing as a perfect learning environment. Mm. Yeah, um, really nicely yeah. said. That's really nicely summarized. I was just saying this to, I think, one of my sisters yesterday, um, a long time ago. How do people learn? They, they learn by reading. Um, yeah. You wanted to know more about a, a subject, you just read about it. You don't need much, just that desire mm-hmm. and that will to learn. Adventures in Learning Design is brought to you by LearnJam. You can find out more about us and the work that we do at learnjam.com. And if you're interested to learn more about inclusive learning design and to download our ILXD dimensions, then head over to learnjam.com resources.